I don't have a lot of maps, and I don't have a lot of diagrams, and the old chapter was very much looking more around uh, the empirical information. Um, so I think that's one of the, the greater advances. So we're looking at uh, observations on impacts, observations on adaptation that's already occurring, and observations on the kind of limits to adaptation. So what we have is, um, I also don't have the final versions of my tables and figures, so they're not as pretty as they should be, but we also have a lot of tables. So it's very much about evidence synthesis, I think. So um, the good thing about the regional chapters, of course, is that you can synthesise evidence across sectors because impacts don't happen in isolation. Um, so that was an advantage of our chapter, and we managed to do, although we basically divided it into these four sectors here, and we aggregated or we synthesised information across those sectors, we were also able, well, within each sector, then we were also able to look across the sectors. And as a kind of general... Um, update compared to AR4, um, there was a lot more information in the first category, basically a lot more work around infrastructure, risk to infrastructure, and, and particularly the urban environment and how urban planning could help, maybe less on the kind of rural planning component, um, and also more around environmental quality and observations. So we also, Europe had a lot, has a lot, a lot of research. So we had a huge amount of information, which of course in the IPCC context is both a blessing and a, and a curse, really. So uh, we also decided to disaggregate. So we looked sub-regionally as well. And I'm glad Richard mentioned scale because how you, the scale of your assessment also dictates the information that you have. Because some of these models are very different on the scale that they're operating as. So you, you may have some inconsistencies across the different scales, certainly from the global to more local studies. And you also have to take into account things like publication bias. So you're much, for the local studies, are much more likely to assume negative impacts and that sort of thing, as you get more of a, a balance on a global type assessment. So what I was saying, so the advantage we did within Europe and what was new is we're obviously integrating or looking across the different sectors. So we could take a multi-sector approach and also see how impacts in one sector might affect another sector. But the other thing that we were doing that was new was looking at impacts in the context of the kind of changing policy environment. So basically most, or previously you just focus on that kind of right hand column. You just look at kind of ch climate change, changing exposures, then have a kind of impact model and then an outcome. So it's very kind of scenario led, this top down issue. But uh, there's obviously, in Europe, is compared to other regions, I suppose, has mitigation po policies in place and has adaptation policies. So we were able to look at impacts or observed impacts, certainly in that context, and think about them for the future impacts. So that was quite something new. So one of the other new things we did was we looked at, we applied the ecosystem framework. So this is one of our tables, and basically it just shows the number of studies showing either positive impacts or increased ecosystem services and then negative, so neg a reduction in ecosystem services. So again, you can see, and these are our basic um, sub-regions within Europe for the columns. So you can see there's a balance of positive and negative impacts. Okay, and also the literature is not huge, so not a lot of uh, model to compare across. So it's important to assess the benefits, we all know that, but again, we need to do better to assess those benefits. Um, and one of the, or a couple of the benefits may not be as big as projected because we've had these recent um, major heat waves basically in Europe. So things like air quality and certainly food production, um, I know it's still debatable, but one of the big discussion points of our chapter was are those benefits really going to materialise because we've been having these extreme events? So those are obviously key researchable questions. Um, so a key impact from our chapter, and in fact the um, key risks that, that Chris showed by region was, base, was impacts of heat, increased heat events, but heat events affecting multiple sectors. So it's not just about heat or on, on deaths, but also heat. This is the example of 2003, heat on transport systems, heat on food production, on the agricultural sector, massive problems with air pollution, um, problems with water quality as well and also impacts on conservation. And the same, you can also see that in the recent flood events. Um, 
So this is Moscow, uh, 11,000 people died in this, in Moscow alone, in the, I think the excess over July and August. So that is a huge, huge amount of people. So that's from the, the air pollution there is obviously caused both by, you know, traffic, which is the leading cause of kind of man-made air pollution, as well as the fires. So mega fires is also a key risk that, that's emerging. But I want to highlight this issue around data and observations. Again, we really don't have a good idea of what the impacts of this event was. And I'd like to be corrected if I'm wrong, but we still don't know this impact on crop yields or um, the total burden on health, total burden from the air quality, the eco impacts on ecosystems and so on. You know, and we really should be able to have a better handle on this and be able to add up and, uh, and quantify this sort of effect. And then the other thing we looked at is responses. So are we better able to deal with these sorts of events? So we, there is sort of limited information about how people are better adapted to heat. We have a lot of heat wave plans. We don't think there's been a massive changes in housing to improve kind of overheating risks, et cetera. So you can look across sectors to see who's better or not at coping with extremes. So following a major flood event, um, Countries often improve their flood defences, so we know some of that is going on. But and then there's uh, more research at the moment, or it's a very big uh, area looking at resilience, the so sort of community level responses to, to extreme events. Um, I did thought I had to include a map. So here's a climate related map. This is a, a threshold for 18 degrees in relation to malaria. So we have a lot of, um, well, there's a lot of research on uh, mapping risks. So this is kind of relatively easy to do to map climate related risks and for health. You can map a lot of kind of disease transmission um, risks, but they give you limited information because what you really want to do is be able to validate it in terms of outcomes. You know, because if you just look at the climate, it's obviously not telling you what the, um, what the socioeconomics are. A lot of diseases are controlled. So the, the malaria distribution, as I'm sure everybody knows as well, within the climatic limits, with the exception of these highland areas in East Africa. So it has been debated, they've had a long, long discussion around uh, whether climate warming is affecting malaria in the East African highlands. And in fact, after 10 years, a paper has just been shown that it is. So a science paper came out earlier this year. So there's quite a long... Uh, I mean, that's far too long, basically, if you're looking at kind of types of evidence. So again, a lot of that is based on um, the lack of data and the lack of kind of a long-term health observation. So, you know, this is not a new problem, but if you look at the within the health chapter, there is hardly any uh, high quality epidemiological studies from sub-Saharan Africa. There's a lot emerging from China now, but maybe from South Asia, very, very little information. And a lot of that is is dictated basically because there's a lack of long-term or current observations, and we're talking about mortality and morbidity, which is non-fatal you know, events like malaria and so on. So uh, kind of a plea for more investment in data, particularly in these vulnerable com communities, so, or climate-sensitive communities. This is taken from Nuna, which is in Burkina Faso. So it's very hot there, often reaches 40. So they're very near thresholds for kind of human tolerance, human activity. How, if it gets hotter, that, you know, obviously people don't work during the, most of the day, but, you know, that period, the time when people can go outdoors is going to get shorter and shorter, and how will those sorts of effects be apparent? So we need to put in surveillance now to pick those up and to reiterate um, Richard's point about scaling. So although some environmental data is available, there's a lot of satellite data, it's linking, you know, from the individual, the household, to the community, to the kind of region and up and down. A lot of that work still has to be done and invested in. Um, just a point also about social impacts. So this is, it's not just health, you know, this is impacts on people, this is impacts on, on us and how to, you know, obviously I'm a, a quantitative person. We do need more quantitative evidence for this. So I don't want to, there's a lot of very, very excellent qualitative research being done, but it's very much process orientated or perception orientated. Um, and it's not outcome focused. So for a kind of risk assessment, you really need more quantification. And a lot of that, so the kind of the <coughs> primary questions would be around the social impacts of disasters. And this is true for Europe. It's, it's true for everywhere. You know, how many people are displaced, what happens to them, what happens to their jobs, impacts of flooding on businesses 
we actually have very little idea around that. And if you add all those sort of social and health impacts of extreme events into your kind of cost-benefit equations, it does alter things quite dramatically. And I know there are, there are also kind of a lot of methodological issues here, I think, about using mixed methods and evidence synthesis and how you put qualitative data into these sorts of assessments. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done there. The example of the, uh, the reindeer herd has shown that there is some populations within Europe that are still very, uh, very based within their environment or very connected to their environment. But most of us are not well connected to, the, to our environment, but our environment does af affect us. So I think there's a real kind of lesson there that people need to understand better how the environment affects their health and well-being. And a particular result also was the um, impacts on cultural landscapes. So there are particular areas in Europe, um, you know, sort of peatlands or uplands or um, the cork forests, you know, that are very much at risk and that people value. And once those are lost, they would be lost forever. And we uh, also did a particular thing on wine production. And again, some of those, um, that has value beyond its direct economic benefit to, to regions in France, you know, if they lose the terroir or whatever, or it has to move, um, then, then they, they lose a the premium and so on. So... There's a lot of these kind of social, cultural issues that are sort of just being researched at the moment um, that are of great interest. Um, this is a... Uh, we also looked at the limits of impact, uh, the limits of adaptation in Europe. And again, I'm just pointing this out because this... Obviously, all the, the modelling that's done needs to characterise adaptation better. We all know that. And I'm not going to discuss this because I know Franz is going to go into this in detail. But again, a lot of this is around uh, empirical observational data. And um, there's also a, a lot of research on behaviour change. So I think that's one of the key directions for future um, research, how people cope with adaptation and, and or how to improve the uptake of, of adaptation methods. And just finally, to reiterate the point made by Chris, is that we are really looking at opportunities here. So it's not just policies, and I'm giving this... This is from our figure, our chapter. It's the impacts on bio or interventions for biodiversity that benefit mitigation or benefit adaptation or both, okay, which is your win 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 um, on the left hand side. But you could do this for any uh, of the sectors, basically. So we just want more of these figures, more of this information, more quantification to, to kind of quantify these benefits and, and losses which is moving towards um, decision support. So you'll see that green rooftops is actually the most positive intervention all round, which Chris showed a photograph of. And um, I think Andy Haynes is going to pick up later about these very large benefits to health that can be accrued from mitigation policies and from adaptation policies. So it's just a plea for better evidence to have um, a better assessment of all the social and economic benefits of specific responses and win-win situations. And finally, it's not just for the scientists to say where the research should go. Um, I think everyone agrees interdisciplinary research is essential for this, but getting into the interdisciplinary research done is actually very difficult, and it's really up to the funders who have to get together and support, you know, research councils have to get together. Um, to support and uh, sustain interdisciplinary research funding. So there's a real need there. And the Living with Environmental Change LWEC programme is one of, has that role to try and bring funders together to facilitate interdisciplinary research. And I'll give two um, excellent examples there, which may be supporting some people in the room. So finally, Chris, uh, um, sorry, Neil asked me to um, summarise what we did well and what we not, didn't do so well in AR5. And this is more from the kind of European um, perspective. So we um, integrated very well with Working Group 1. We actually had someone from Working Group 1, a climatologist, Daniela Jacob, on our chapter, and she was brilliant. So I thought that worked very well. We had very good climate information, very helpful. But integration with Working Group 2 didn't really work. You know, we don't, specifically in terms of the health uh, information, getting that, that needs to be much better brought into Working Group 2 and very little exchange of, of information. Um, we did very well on the intra-regional, so distributions of impacts within Europe and uh, whether they were going to um, increasing or decreasing regional disparities, for example, you know, these kind of high-level questions. 
what is difficult to do is um, impacts across regions. So how you know, global economic systems might affect Europe, how food might be affected within Europe. We buy in food. You know, those are questions are very difficult. We need different sorts of tools, <coughs> different sorts of evidence to look at those, how the regions are interconnected with one another. Um, as has been stated, we have uh, quite a lot of studies now, it impacts up to four degrees, but very little uh, uh, studies that look at impacts before, beyond four degree warming, and you know, hence the need to move to a more risk management focus, but there needs to be better methods and tools for dealing with four degrees, where we know things will be different, we can't just extrapolate um, from the current situation. And there are um, two projects, Helix and Impressions, that we'll be looking at these kind of high-end scenarios. So with any luck, there'll be some good methodological development within those projects. So uh, we did very well at detection attribution in ecological systems, huge amount of information now about how species are responding <coughs> to climate change. Um, very little information and very little consistency about how to approach, uh, you know, so there's disagreement within the community about how we treat detection and attribution within human or within humans as well. Um, I've already mentioned that there's a serious evidence gap regarding health impacts in kind of low income countries which are likely to be more vulnerable. And just a final point, so we're very good at describing and mapping geographical un vulnerability but vulnerability also occurs within populations as well. This is true within Europe um, and within <coughs> cities and within um, communities. And adaptation, <coughs> if it's not done equally, is also likely to increase some inequalities as well. So that's quite an important direction for future research. <coughs>